It's Friday and welcome to another episode of the Tea and Trails podcast. We have a new Patreon partner, Mountain Fuel, has joined a huge list of partners who are helping our Patreon save a few quid and support the podcast at the same time. Who are these wonderful partners and what the hell is Patreon? Well, for the price of a cuppa or a couple of gels, uh, you could unlock some sneaky discounts from Outdoor Active, Vela Forte, Silver, Active Root, Centurion Running, Store, Protein, Rebel, Sportshoes.com, Big Bobble Hats and X Miles. Massive thanks to all our Patreons. Seriously, we could not do this without your support. Go over to Patreon and check out all the amazing deals. I wore my hoodie for 24 hours. Uh, I'll spill the reason why a little bit later, but welcome to episode 24. How you all doing? This week, we get to chat to the lovely Emma Stewart and hear all about Gary winning the world champions at the Hard Moors. I won it. And really, he won it. I mean, the rest of the team <laughs> did something, he said, but he's not sure what. Uh, I'm exhausted from following all the Kate Rathra dots. Loved it. Loved it. Well done if you just finished that. Looks like the weather gods were pretty kind. Uh, the day seven, I think, was a bit vile. Though I heard the midges were pretty mad at the runners. Well done to my special, Scott Nichols, husband of Karen Nichol, who was on the show a couple of weeks ago, and she mentioned he yeah. was going off to do it. And, of course, Debs Martin Consani, who both smashed it. And Karen and I enjoyed WhatsApping each other all week, every time when they came up on the like little live feed of pictures and stuff. So huge congrats if you finished that challenge. Tell us all about it rest up now feet up hopefully you're on your way back home now come on then what's the t-shirt you've got on today gary uh, it's the hob <laughs> i know god i'm not a good advert for teas trees not teas um and i what you know i did think oh do i accept this t-shirt but because it was the relay team it was a special relay team i thought no no this was quite special to 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 wear this t-shirt with pride but yeah hard moors really 110 and i am absolutely pooped eddie after your voice sounds a, a little more like a husky. Um, <laughs> a husky. I, i've checked my heart rate variability but it's about all, all fine everything's in the green still uh but yeah just after missing a night's sleep and being high a kite on adrenaline all saturday until my shift which i think was oh i am forgetting the time about half past nine at night so i was wired you do the race kit check Stress, oh, make sure everything's is right. Is there anything that makes my armpits sweat more <laughs> than the race, than the kit check? Yeah. Well, we had to do all that, uh, the kit check, but we didn't physically, sorry, the kit pack, but we didn't have a kit check. Possibly get checked along the way and at the finish. So you have to, you know, you have to do it. You can't be messing around. But yeah, pretty wired, like that wired checking the dots, seeing how the race was progressing. So yeah, I was pretty high as a kite. How on do you get like? So have you got? Are you in a van with the other relay runners? Do you see the other guys? Were you do? Were you like following them, or did you just sort of go to where you start? I met them because I was the last runner. I didn't think it was very good for me to be out all day, getting up super early. So I thought I'd have a bit of a line if possible. And Lisa drove me down to the Horse and Hounds car park, which is just outside of Gisborough. And that's where I met the team. And then, yeah, we followed, we, we all stayed together after that and went to, yeah, the finish. And it was just um, wild. I never thought when, I think I taught, said this last week, I just thought it was going to be a bit of a, a lonely time trial to the, to, to the finish. I never thought it would be a race, but immediately watching the dots, it was like, wow, this is game on. And um, Chris, the front runner, he, he took an early lead, but then he lost the lead. It was super hot. Neil, second runner, clawed it back. Adam, uh, he set off from the horse and hound car park where I was. The guy who Adam was running against was such a strong runner. He re You could just see he had a real sense of purpose when he shot past when he shot past us in the car park. So when Adam met me at Lordstone's Cafe, we had about a 25-minute gap. We'd lost our lead. And okay. We're now in second place. So yeah, I was pretty, pretty stressed. <laughs> I was like watching the clock. I'm thinking I had about 28, 29, 30 miles, 25 minutes. I just thought that was a bit of a, a bridge too far. So set off, I had this heart rate plan, 122 beats, 140 beats. And if uh, I exceeded, if it got to the high 130s or 140s, that's when I'd I'd walk. Luckily, the climbs on the moors, they're not enormous like a Lake District climb or a climb that you're used to. So you could maybe do a quite a short climb, then you'd start running again. But what I found when the sun started to dip, my head torch on the flagstones, it really threw me and I couldn't take advantage of the downhills 
potential because I was just worried I was going to trip up and go flat on my face. But um, yeah, I just had to trust the process, trust myself and trust my discipline. And slowly but surely, I started to claw this guy back. So the first checkpoint I went past, I forget the name, it's just outside of Osmotherly near Codbeck Reservoir. The chap said um, about 10 minutes gap. I was like, wow, that's 15 minutes already, which I think was maybe five or six miles. I took it with a little bit of a pinch of salt because sometimes, you know, wonderful yeah. checkpoint people, but sometimes the times can be a bit uh, inaccurate. So I took it for what it was. And then I just kept running. I kept making some silly wrong turns in the dark. I know that part of the country very well. Um, but yeah, just going through the wrong gate, running for 10 metres, turning around. Uh, I had, <laughs> it was super, I had super uh, tummy troubles. I kept taking wheeze all the time. I must have had about 10 or 15 wheeze. Tried for the toilet twice, which didn't, number two, sorry, uh, which didn't, uh, <laughs> I couldn't go. So all these little stops, you know, half a minute here, a minute there, they were just accumulating time. And I was really getting pretty anxious about that. We saw my crew again. And they said that was down to six minutes now, the gap, which initially I thought, well, I'd made um, about 15 minutes in that first chunk, which is five miles. And over that next 15 miles, I've only reduced the gap by four minutes. Yeah. So it's a bit negative that, well, I, I, I'm not going as fast as I need to. And then we did a, this loop. Lord Sons is a funny, sorry, not Lord Sons, sorry, White Horse Car Park. You go into it, do a bit of a loop and then come back out of it. And that's when I saw my crew again. And they said that gap's down about four and a half minutes now. And I was like, oh, wow, I'm moving quite quick compared to uh, the other runner. Um, and I'd made a promise to myself, don't have a wee now. This is these, these 30 seconds. I didn't know what you were going to say then. I you were going to say something like really deep and like mentally no, strong. No. <laughs> well, I was saying to myself because I watched this Nike film and one little slogan that popped up was, um, you know, the job's not done until it's done. So I just kept thinking that was my little um, mantra in my head. Every time I wanted to walk or anything like that or just slow down, I just kept applying that pressure. And then out of nowhere, I saw this... Um, head torch and it was like my goodness me he's he is there i can now see him i had no idea if he was just a random out on the trails or <laughs> he was <laughs> he was this runner but i just then i thought right okay i looked at my heart rate it was uh well within my range so i just increased it by by a few beats but nothing crazy i didn't want to burn my matches and then him come past me potentially again and uh, caught each other up had a few uh words nothing did you do? what did you say <laughs> Well, it was just like, hi, how's it going? And, you know, how you doing and stuff like that. It wasn't anything uh, deep and meaningful. But look, you kept me right, actually, because I was, again, going to make a little silly mistake. Um, my watch would have beat and told me after 10 metres. But, yeah, I was off down another path. And he said, oh, I think it's I think it's this way. <laughs> it's just very I sweet. I so would never have done that. See ya. <laughs> Head torch off. <laughs> yeah, <Bye>. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then when I pass someone, if I've got the energy, I like to do this. It's I call it a heartbreaker where... You just wind it up a little bit. I can call it the crusher. <laughs> yeah. Crusher, the heartbreaker. But you just, fingers crossed, they don't come with you. And that's go, the little test. Go. Um, You've got to break the thread. You've got to break the yeah. thread. Go. And then once you're around the corner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then that was it. Um, and he didn't. Luckily, I turned around and his head touch, head touch was nowhere to be seen. And then we were getting to these like about three or four miles to go. And that's when I actually drew on something that Trish was saying the other day, because I used to do that classic, oh, it's only a park run to go. But yeah, I'm not really familiar with those courses. And then I reframed it like, oh, this is a Rex dog walk. This is a Rex dog jog. And that's what I did and um, held it together. Didn't burn the matches and came into a super sleepy Helmsley. And <laughs> whatever time of morning it was, ran up to the cricket club, and uh, yeah, finished. You know, it was such like th that's when it was this quiet experience because literally there was just a few of us there at the finish. But it really, I never thought it would be a race. But from the off, like I said, the, we were but watching. Wasn't it just so much fun that it was a race? You oh, got so much more out of that than if you would like either like an hour and a half lead or you know an hour behind. And there was it totally over. It totally over delivered that the, the whole jeopardy through the day. We totally took our eye off the team that came second in the end. We were so obsessed with oh my goodness, I can't remember the what they were called, the Quadzillas or something like that, the, the team who ended up coming third. <laughs> well, we took an early, early lead, the, the, the Quad Crushers. Um, they chased us down. They had a different tactic. We just split the reel open into roughly four quarters while this other team were doing smaller sections. So then we'd be running for an hour and then swapping over. So they're all 
fresh okay. legs, but they're, but yeah. they're all going for the full 24 hours. Yeah. While we just thought, okay, someone did 26, I did 30, Chris did 32. So we all just did big chunks. And the second place team did the same as us. So I was always expecting the uh, the quads people to come back and catch us up. But in the end, I think we put in over an hour on those guys. So while I was so super focused on them and took our eyes off uh, the easy runner team, but it turned out they were our biggest competition in the end. And yeah, I just, I, I did feel a bit overcome when I was coming to Helmsley because I had this 25 minutes to claw back. And I really thought it was beyond me. It was, it was, it was really, um, I just felt it was a bit too much, but to come back. And I think, I think in the end, I even then extended the lead. I put 10 or 15 minutes into the Jeez, second. Jeez, Carrie, you're on fire. I had, honestly, I just said before I recorded, I hope that is not, sometimes you, <laughs> sometimes you do your best races in training and I really hope I'm like, that, that's it. Now I've, uh, over exceeded for the year and little hundreds a complete disaster but it's all right you got that t-shirt should... now you got a t-shirt <laughs> yeah, and a mug <laughs> season's done and the plaque got a little da-da. plaque um, oh, you, I've you, got a... did you each get a plaque or did you steal that and go i need no, it no well i thought i'd take it for the for the for the podcast heavy flex um but they... <laughs> i'll give it back to whoever whoever wants to take it home after this but i loved it and then we all did our bit you know everybody everybody did 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 their piece you know chris did a, a, a stonking uh quick start then robo got us back into first place adam kept us in the game with like for the his third section and then yeah i kind of just uh <laughs> you crushed it basically i mean you didn't want you know the other three did okay but you were the crusher oh Pod i don't crusher. know crikey uh, it, it was um it was a complete it was a full team effort. And I loved it because I've said many a time that with all this fell running, and then sometimes I do a long run, it's like, oh, goodness me, I, this is really hard running for yeah, 20 yeah, miles, yeah. a proper run. But to run for 30 miles, I felt okay. So it really did give me loads of confidence. And it was great because I just thought I was going to be on my own, complete time trial. How am I going to motivate myself? There's nobody around me. But no, no, no. I felt oh, like no, I no. Immersed, oh, no, no. immersed in the in the race and yeah, I totally over delivered. I absolutely loved it. My nutrition, I up my um normally I do uh, something every 30 minutes. I went for every 20 minutes instead. I just thought I'd keep that topped up. I was gelling it all the way because it was more runnable. Yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah, I didn't want to eat anything shove solid. It. Yeah. Yeah. And I had all my active root gels uh stuffed in a soft flask. It was pretty minging, you know. It was like just this big Loop. but yeah that was great Sticky, well. a big loopy bear <laughs> i had some better 40 chews uh what else did i drink i drank active root too so i was pretty ginger <laughs> overloaded <laughs> but it, it serves me well i can't really argue but during the no. day i was using those raw velo bars again that we got from x miles and afterwards uh again because x miles sent it to us i used the talk energy cookies and cream protein shake i thought after all of that sugar and everything all day that was going to really trigger my stomach but no no it was nice really did taste like cookies and cream i was pretty it was pretty good so considering all the food fatigue i was pretty pretty happy with that and i've just got to say you know all the marshals this i think it's 39 hours to complete the 110 but also there'd been the 160 which had started the day before so all the team would have just been absolutely shattered oh, yeah, over sure. that whole weekend. So yeah, thanks to Shirley and John and everybody else who helped on such a brilliant heard day. such lovely things always about the Hardmore races. Oh, it's awesome. It sounds like a well, lovely I, family and people love them and go back and... Well, I felt this is long overdue that I tore the line on a Hardmore's race. I was there last year in a supporting role for a friend who was running, Chris, who was part of our team. I did a big chunk of that course with him as a support runner, but yeah long overdue, entering and torn the line at one of their races. And I've got so much to thank them for because they, I think I said the other week, uh, a little intro into me. When I was searching for lots of different marathons when I was doing the fundraising, it was the Hard Moses Motherly Trail Marathon which popped up on my radar. And that's what was like, wow, this is uh, <laughs> this is thing called trail running. <laughs> this is awesome. So yeah, huge thanks to everyone there and everyone else who else tore the line. This almost 200 is really... Is it talking know, maybe, to you? It is talking to me. But then I'm thinking Backyard Ultra, there's a Track 24, which has popped up on the local radar. So there's lots of things. I don't want to get too greedy and wish away next year too early. But yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe the Hardmore's 200. Mm-hmm. And a big shout out actually to Mark Thacker, one of 
our patrons and listeners to the show and I ran with uh, Mark with this uh, when I recorded that film with Daniel by a few couple of months ago now now Mark completed the 110 and at the end of it he popped the question to his long suffering crew chief oh and thankfully goodness. she said yes so yeah congratulations <laughs> congratulations lovebird love it isn't she lucky to have such a yeah. romantic proposal he's run 110 miles he stinks he's covered in gel probably a bit of poo and wee <laughs> <laughs> Cherish that moment. Cherish yeah, was, that moment. <laughs> it was just a wonderful, wonderful thing to be involved in. And like I said, we had quite a lonely experience. So the people who were immersed in it all in a busier day, it just would have been magic, magic. And it was super sunny. So yeah, lovely, lovely photographs to mark the memory. The week, 97 miles in total, 20 hours of training and about 9,000 feet of vert. So a little bit down on the vert, but a lot more running. A lot more running. Yeah, I'm just pleased to get a good run under my belt. Feeling positive, Eddie. What about you? Feeling positive. Oh, I'm so unexciting compared to you. Get such a uh, FOMO <sighs> from all these races, Gary. And my friends were all at the maxi races this weekend. So I didn't even oh, training. Awesome. Yeah, well done. Big shout out. Welsh Bird. Do you remember Welsh Bird? We gave I us do, some advice. Yeah. And do you know? <laughs> so Welsh Bird had two races to do at the maxi race and she was first at the end of day one. So she All really right. listened to our advice. <laughs> and she was she was second at the end of day two. So she did listen. She Oof. did send me messages saying, um, I did listen, I went out slower. It was a super hot weekend and we haven't had any super hot weather here yet. This was like our first time. So um, everybody was melting over in Annecy. But well done to Beth, who was second. Uh, she did the two stages. She's preparing for a massive trail race which i'm gonna help crew her the weekend after south downs way 100 and well done to hills hills um is my pal in a lot of the skiing stories that i tell and she was actually a picture of her she's this blonde she's like uh me blonde long blonde hair but double my height okay. so when we go running like she wears like these lovely scores she had she's got amazon type legs the farmers go like what and then this little stumpy eddie come behind her anyway she was actually her she was on the dossards a picture of her she's um skiing so she's super cool she'd done the marathon uh did really well as well so well done those two um awesome. anyway so i didn't do that i just a lot of FOMO all weekend tracking everybody. But I had, yeah, a good week, good last full, full week. I had some tired legs, Gary. I did a race simulation on Tuesday, I think. Was it Tuesday? We recorded on Monday last week. Headed off yep. four hours straight out. I hate the first hour of a long run. I always feel horrible. Heart rate's a bit high, a bit out of breath. Don't really know why. Anyway, Bryn said he had a 90-minute run to do, so he said, I'll do it. With I'll do the first 90 minutes with you. So I was like, great. Anyway, he annoyed me so much because he was just half-shouldering me oh. all the time, just ahead of me. And at one point, I grabbed hold of him and I like pulled him back and I was like, just run next to me. And then he's like, oh, I'll just go home. I'll just go home. You're in a mood. And I was like, no, oh. just like, just making me feel so I don't it. understand how I run with Lisa and I'm exactly the same. I'm about two foot ahead of her. But then I steer the same pace. But then you're not... just annoying me running the same pace because you're yeah. clearly like, oh, I've got no idea why. It. You poor, pathetic <laughs> woman. Anyway, he made me, he, we did do a, good, a good, couple of good big climbs that we ran up together and that was way too hard. My heart rate was like 158. I was like, I'm not telling him, I'm not slowing down. I'm not slowing down, I'm (laughs) staying next to him. And uh, (laughs) then he turned for home and then I was like, oh, I was doing like the maths in my head going, oh no, I've still got like two and a half hours to go. I'm absolutely my legs anyway it was good but i did yeah i just carried on get on with it eddie uh so that felt quite a long way and my watch died as well oh is there anything worse than your watch dying crushed crushed me so i don't actually know what the distance was in the end i think it was about 22 miles and about four and a half thousand feet of foot so good uh, a good long run. Um, after that day, then I had the kids. It was a Wednesday and I have to, if I'm going to get up on a Wednesday and run, I've got to get up and go like a suit, seven o'clock. I didn't have it in me, Gary. I didn't have it in me. And I was like, Do you know what? I'm going to have a rest day. I can't remember the last time I had a total day off. I loved it. I got all my Jeans admin on. done. Shower, Gary. Shower. 
Not jeans, <laughs> leggings. Jeans are well fancy. Okay. Pair of uh, pair of yoga That's leggings. That's out. Nice high waistband. Keep it. Keep it all. Tuck it all in. <laughs> <laughs> I cleaned. I blitzed the house. Clean, scrubbed. I even mopped the bathroom floor. That's massive. Can't remember the last time I did that. Um, I did all my paperwork, enjoyed the day. I just let myself, just ate a lot of food. It gave me loads of energy for the rest of the day. And, uh, so yeah, next day I was like, right, come on, I'm going to feel great. Six by eight minutes uphill. Four by eight minute, felt okay. I thought I've got going to do two more. So I did two separate long climbs, pretty steep in places. The last one, Gary, I was literally like, I was running, but I was like running on the spot because I didn't want to go any more up the hill because my legs hurt so much. So I was like taking all the, I was taking all the detail doors around the rocks so that I didn't have to get stopped. Got to the top. <laughs> Five and a half, six miles from home. Oh my God. I was like, oh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Lord. And it's a really rocky path down my poor legs. I had to have a Yeah, whole... I was thinking that well, how technical it was running yeah, down. Yeah, I had to have a whole... Well, it's like a track, but it's just really rocky. So it's not even like a lovely alpine, like down a meadow, rocky single track. It's just this like rocky track so you can catch your toe on the every like third step mm. or, or you kick a toe anyway I had to have a whole 90 grams of um, precision hydration gel after Please. the sessions <laughs> and I was like I'm not going to get it was so slow the run home was nothing nothing what's your like, effort for the what's your effort for the it minutes? was pretty hard effort it was a good, you know, top end 160 heart rate for those eight minutes. Oh, but it was too long. I did one too many. But then I'd sort of committed myself to getting to the top of this climb. Of course, it felt failure if I didn't do it. Why? That I don't is know. big, isn't anyway. it? Six eights. Wow, that's a big Six session. eights, that was a lot. Yeah, it's almost 1,000 metres, I reckon that was. And then the next day, joined my mates for their long run. Useless. Yeah, I was useless. Every time it pitched uphill, I was like, let's walk. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Let's walk. <laughs> yeah. Lovely, yeah, lovely long hilly run. By Saturday, it was pretty wiped out and um, had no childcare. So sort of jogged around with the kids on their bikes. That's always that's always um, my pretend run. I'm like, yeah, we'll go for a run. Really, we stand. I stand and by the river <laughs> and count three miles. There's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and then we decided we were going to go. Uh, up into the mountains for a bit of wild camping. I taught last week everyone was going camping and I don't like campsites. They're like car parks. Why would you go and park yeah. your tent in a car? I just don't get it. And all those people. I don't like people and I don't like car parks. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, <laughs> we just decided, we packed up the tent. We knew we've got a few places around us where you can drive to so we can take the bigger tent. So we just got like this massive, you know, the tents they use in Dragon's Back. Well, you will know them intimately. The yeah, big yeah. blue birdhouse ones. Anyway, we've got one of those that we, it takes like two seconds to put up. You can't, get, it's massively heavy, but if you've got some, if you can park somewhere where you can take it and then it's super easy because we can all sleep in the same tent. So we literally just shoved sleeping bags in the van and took the tent, got some um, pizzas, cooked the pizzas, awesome. and then just went up the hill. Jet <laughs> boil, obviously, for tea bags and milk. And then off we went. It was love. We had a love time. Unfortunately, the minute we took the tent up, we had a massive hailstorm. Oh, um, wow. So that was fine. What? We went, I know, we went into, it happens, it's May. We went inside the tent and, um, and the kids played hangman and we we read our book. So I said, this is painting a picture. Really, they just like basically played sleeping man, bury each other, sleeping bag, <laughs> bury each other. Um, but then, of course, everything was so wet outside. Yeah. So all the grass and everything was a bit wet. Anyway, we had a lovely time. We climbed a little mountain. We actually all slept quite well. Um, but then everyone was pretty tired. It's just tiring. It's just tiring being outside all that it's time. It's exhaust. Camping is exhausting. Camping exhausting. Um, even though, yeah, Lindy, Lindy, Taki's happy in her bed. The dogs were exhausted because they obviously are like on a 24 hour walk because they're just free in the mountain. Lindy yeah. did not want to sleep in her bed and ended up in everybody's sleeping bag. She just rotated around the family. <laughs> I made her like a little bed next to me with like my coats and my jumper at about three o'clock. I was like, well, just sleep on that. She was like, no. Nope. In here is really, really warm. <laughs> he like was going head first in going, I get in here with you. She's really bony. Oh, um, oh, I love that. Snuggles yeah, you'd have loved it. And so I was like, no, no, no. And Bryn was like, 
I'll take her. <laughs> <Grabbed her. laughs> Bryn is such a professional camper. He like gets in there. We got into bed about 10. He lies down, does a sleeping bag up on his back. He's like a dead person, shuts his eyes. I literally turn around, he's asleep. And I'm like, oh, what? How do these the people hell? do that? I can't do that. I'm like sliding off my roll mat. I can't get yeah. comfortable. I'm cold. I'm like, Bryn, wake up. Talk I get to jealous me. <laughs> when for, if we're if the if we're in the youth hostel or camping and somebody immediately just drops asleep. How like, do they do that? Oh, I need a good <laughs> forty-five minutes decompress. Anyway, yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah. So then for all that it was lovely. We had such a lovely time. But then we come back. It takes us like eight hours to dry everything up, clear everything up, and uh, we both all day. Bryn had a lot of flat session to do all day. We were like. Ugh. Uh, and I have a lot of work to do on Sundays too with all my clients. So um, anyway, it got to like six o'clock. I'm going to do it, Bryn. I'm gonna, he's like, I'm not doing mine. I was like, and now I'm not encouraging him because I'm like, you're getting too fit. I'm not going to be able to keep up. So I was like, no, yeah, you have a rest day. I'll go and do my flat session. So I, I jumped on the treadmill and I bribed myself. I told myself, I'll just do an hour. I'll just do an hour. I said to Bryn, I'll do an hour. Uh, I jumped on the treadmill did 10 minutes easy and then I was like right I'm going to do some uh some long flat stuff I thought I haven't got three minute four minutes efforts in me I'm going to do some slightly slower but longer stuff so started off 20 minutes I was like yeah I can pretty fit 12 minutes and I was like I'm gonna go I'm gonna do this so I did 20 minutes 12 minutes 10 minutes eight six four two just probably about uh a little bit faster than marathon pace, just enough that it was like comfortable, but a little bit yeah. uncomfortable. I love that. I've yeah. decided that that is my training effort now. I'm an old lady. I'm like, <laughs> I like that, like just above comfortable pace. I think I think the longer hill reps have really helped me. And I would, I felt like last night I was like, I could do this again, even though that session is like an hour and I think it was like an hour and 20 minutes worth of work. And it, yeah. oh my God, I was just sweat, disgusting, so sweaty. But I felt so strong. Um, I love it. I love a general aerobic run. Just to see that little bit. Just a little, little bit, bit harder. Below. And that's hard. I can't really do it out here, out on the trails. There's too much heart rate spiking. And sh unless I ran laps around a lake, which I'm not going to do. I don't know. <laughs> so it was, it was the end of a good week. Not as much climbing because I had a rest day. And then I ran on the treadmill as I normally do. But that's not such a bad thing either. So yeah, feeling pretty good. Going to do one more long run to tick off the box. But I'm really happy that I I've worked, come from the spine, I've recovered, yeah. recovered, and I've done a, a a block, a good block of training. I feel back on it. I feel strong. I've really listened to the body and I'm not injured, which is my big, I was always was my fear was that I was going to get a niggle or get injured. But I've just really listened and just kept it like, always kept it just slightly low achieving than a high achieving <laughs> training block. So could I be in, could I have worked a little bit harder possibly, but I've got no niggles. I've got no. Oh, wow. I Getting on the start line. That is half the battle. I think so. That's what I'm telling myself, yeah. even though I think I get, I get Strava and race FOMO thinking could have done yeah. more. Always. But I think that's our personalities. A constant. 100%. Could have done more. Could have done more in everything. Ugh. I always dwell on the, See if I'm, I don't really miss many sessions, but maybe I'll modify a session. I'll always dwell on that. Yeah, I think you're right. Just all personality. Let it go. Let it go. No brew with the coaches this week. We have got some questions, but we could always do with some more. So yeah, if you're Patreon and you'd like to reach out and ask a question to our coaches, email in at uh, hello at tandtrails.com. Strava, another good wow. week, but there's a name not on the leaderboard this week, which is, <laughs> oh, I wonder what's happened to him this week. But yeah, we'll talk about uh, Robert Driver, 218 miles. And Robert took the uh, win for elevation to 43,000 feet to 43 and 271 thousand feet of elevation that looks like cape wrath miles cape to me wrath all over <laughs> and i wonder if anthony i did check anthony's uh strava and i couldn't see anything but yeah he's done over 70 hours of exercise that week which is pretty epic too yeah well done everybody the mileage was a wash of Cape Wrath runners this week. 
<laughs> and that was pretty Jesus. awesome. I it's loved. tough, isn't it? If you're going to get the lead, you've got to go plus 200 miles to win that yeah. leaderboard. Yeah, it was really yeah. good watching it. I really enjoyed it. Um, I didn't realise, because now obviously with Dragon's Back Race, I'll you're, be in the, uh, yeah, I'm pretty invested in it. All. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. It really has whetted my appetite even more. I can't wait. You're seeing yourself on all those reels, aren't you? And all the uh, daily catch-ups. You're just seeing yourself <laughs> in all your merch. Visualising. <laughs> this is so hard, but I'm managing it. I'm terrible at stuff like that on the spot stuff. So, well. They've got plenty of other people to get content out of. We'll see. Just a quick um, reminder about going and checking out the Running Out of Time Relay, Ben Nevis to Big Ben. It's the big, Britain's biggest sporting celebration of climate action and nature, taking place between June the 10th and June the 11th. You can run, you can walk, you can cycle, and the aim is to take the baton 2,661k from Ben Nevis to Big Ben. Ben, you can go and check it all out at www.running hash out hash out of hash time.com. So that's www.runningoutoftime.com. Gary's entered. I Do I need to enter? I, I'm not going to enter yet, actually, because logistic, I need to work out how I'd actually got to check yeah. trains. You I? do. Yeah. You do need do to I enter. Need to, um, I enter I've entered. And then I'll only disappoint people. <laughs> well, you need to be there, otherwise there's no one hand about. Well, there is. To. I know that David's doing that leg, so okay. I'd be. Yeah. I know that he can carry the bat on. I just need. Yeah, to you can it. actually. I think um, memory serves me right. There can be five people per leg, so you oh, can okay. join. So I better, I, okay, I better oh. find it. I better. S- I might be wrong about the numbers, but you can join a leg that if you see somebody's name on it, you can join them. It doesn't okay. uh, make it exclusive for them. But yeah, I've entered. I'm one of the sections in Newcastle. I think it's from the Baltic up to the Wyland Brewery in uh, Exhibition Park. So yeah, if you want to join me or pass the button, <sighs> or... the dream that will be <laughs> sold out. Yeah, well, if it's not, I might end up doing quite a few miles that day, running around Newcastle, uh, filling up the slots. I could end up doing quite a lot of miles around Newcastle. I'm really looking forward to it, actually. Can't wait. This week, we have a catch-up with Emma Stewart. Oh, my goodness me. Since Emma came on our radar after speaking to uh, Paul Wilson, Bob Graham around Paul Wilson, she has just gone <gasps> from win after win, Lake 100, obviously, Arc of Attrition. Not just winning smashing smashing it yeah and then uh uts snowed on your 100 miler and that is <laughs> i think it's safe to say quite a different race to the arc so such a range and uh just a lovely warm generous person i really enjoyed our chat with emma hope you do too Hi, Emma. Thanks for joining us today. Fresh from the UTS Snowdonia, we ask all of our guests this question. Where are you? What's the view from your window? And have you been for a run today? Thanks for having me on again. Uh, Yeah, so I'm in Penrith in Cumbria. It's a glorious sunny day, but the view out of my window isn't very exciting because it's onto the back garden and the rest of the housing estate. I can see centre parks in the distance, so that's, you know, not too bad. That's about <laughs> it. Uh, and no, I haven't been for a run today, maybe later on. I'm doing some heat training now, so I'm waiting for the hottest part of the day. It's the hottest part of the day in Penrith. How hot does it get? Are we talking like 18, 19 degrees? Probably about 12 degrees. <laughs> no, I think it'll be about, yeah, 20 degrees. <laughs> Jeez, there's going to be some red flesh. Yeah. Red flesh on the housing estate. Um, last time we spoke, you've been, you've been busy. Gosh, you've been busy crushing crushing more souls out on every trail that you encounter, Emma. You've done so far this year. You've had an incredible win at the Arc of Attrition 100 and now at UTS Snowdonia. Two very different races, but two great performances as well. Um, one of the big questions I wanted to ask you was, uh, after the Arc, what did you change in your training to then be able to go? Because though lots of people talk about like sort of the technicality of the arc trail compared to Snowdonia, it's like a track. <laughs> how did you, how did you change your training? What did you look? I think when we, when we last talked, you just started working with, or you're thinking about working with a coach. So what did you sort of do between the arc and Snowdonia? How's this year looked for you? The arc was very runnable. I know people down south say it's not runnable. It is, it's flat. It is flat. Um, so yeah, I did a lot more 
actual running. So then I was really enjoying that. I actually really enjoyed running, it turns out. So having to switch and start thinking about big days out in the hill with big, big elevation and things like that was a bit of a, a mindset change as well because it takes a bit of patience to, to slog up and down hills all day. Um, so yeah, that was mostly what I focused on, just getting elevation in really, to be honest, and then interspersing that with kind of a few faster flat runs, I suppose, try and keep the speed up. You, We have a question from a patron saying, <laughs> did you adapt your training to become a mountain goat? But I think you were already a mountain goat. Uh, Susan Wilson says she stopped at 37k go of the 100k because she felt so hot she couldn't get over it. Did you, uh, did you feel the heat? Did you find that affected your race? And Susan says, do you have any top tips for running in the heat? Yeah, so I, I probably am a little bit lucky, really, in that every week I, on Wednesday, I, I work in a room that's about 38 degrees centigrade. Yeah, 38 to 40 degrees, wearing full waterproofs. Oh. Um, so it's a bit of a hot box. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so that's been absolutely fantastic for my heat training, and that's just part of my job. Um, I don't do it for fun. It's not pleasure. Um, that's not her pleasure. No, time. no, it's not pleasure. I mean, I do enjoy it, but it can be pretty miserable. But, uh, but so actually, yes, it was warm, but I didn't really think about it too much um the most important thing is fluids i mean i could feel myself getting dehydrated especially because even even though uts has a lot of checkpoints and um, you're moving so slowly over that terrain yeah. that it's actually quite a long time between checkpoints yeah. so i was struggling for fluids a little bit but just kept just kept the electrolytes going in um slowly i was having some stomach issues um kind of during the heat of the day, but actually just kind of slowly sipping electrolytes and keeping fluids going in made a huge difference. I usually wear a cap, so I was dunking that at every opportunity just yeah. to try and keep your head cool. Mm. You can keep your head cool. You can keep your head and wrists cool. That makes a huge difference as well. And don't think about it. If you sit there and wallow in your own misery about how hot you feel and how miserable you feel, it's going to be much worse. So just don't think about it. Just one foot in front of the other. Yes, it was warm, but you know it's not as hot as in the you know you know some of the races in the Alps and stuff. So it's just it's just that mindset. Forget yeah. about it, thinking it's hot. Yeah, mindset it's energy, management. Isn't it? You just you, yeah. if you use the wrong energy, it can just yeah. sap you. Is there? I've never done uh, any of the UTS uh, races. I'm familiar with the lakes, you know, quite often you can fill up with water on the way. You mentioned about kind of dunking your hat. Is it similar? Could you, if you had a bottle and a filter, you could you could do that on route. Yeah, there was a few places. It w I wouldn't have said on that route, especially during the hottest part of the day, there was loads of places to get water, not like in the lakes. But there was, there, there was definitely, you know, well, every couple of hours, you'd probably come across some streams. So if you have the foresight to think, ah, I see a stream here, I better do something <laughs> with it. Um, you know, you should be fine. But yeah, uh, not all of it was particularly pleasant to drink, but you could at least dunk your hat. <laughs> <laughs> I said when you dug your hat the, the, the last weekend um, I was at the old county tops and every time yeah well, I'd agree with that every time I dunked my hat for just a few minutes what it was just sensational it was absolutely just exactly what you needed when it was red hot okay yeah UTS 100 mile I've heard a lot of intel about this race very tough how how tough was it? Yeah, you know, yeah just... I'm scared now. She's going to go, yeah, it wasn't that bad, actually. No, yeah. it's terrific. It is. <laughs> right, okay, right. Here we go. You look at adverts for lots of different ultramarathons, and they all say they are the most brutal, the most difficult, the hardest on the planet, blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. UTS is. <laughs> it is really hard. Um, it doesn't... Uh, yeah, I mean, I spoke to a lot of you know, Europeans who had come over and they were surprised at how hard it was. The, the trails aren't groomed. I mean, essentially, it's 100 miles of fell running. You know, Goodness. there's, you know, maybe 10, 10, 15 kilometres, kind of about just over halfway in. That is quite runnable. But the rest of it is fell running. Uh, if you're not used to that, yeah, it's a bit of a shock. I had wrecked it. I knew exactly what I was up against. I think wrecking it probably was, for me, the most important element of my training mm. because I knew exactly what was around each corner. I knew how bad each climb was. You yeah. know, I could gear yeah. myself mentally for it. Uh, that made a huge difference. And I suspect a lot of the DNFs 
especially in the Europeans or the, you know, people from further afield probably was because they hadn't wrecked it. They didn't know what they were up against. It is, it is super tough. But do you know what? You just, you just have to sit back. You just have to accept it's going to be slow. It is slow. I mean, the lowest I felt was when I was going up Moyle Hibbog and 27 minutes to do one kilometre. And I got halfway up. And it was quite hot at that point, even though it was only about eight or nine in the morning, but it was quite hot. And I got halfway up after a 27 minute kilometre and I looked around me and I could see everything that I still had to do, which was over 30 miles. Oh, wow. You know, going back up Snowden. And I just was like, how am I going to do this? Because it's just taken me half an hour to do one kilometre and I've got more than 50 left to do. (laughs) And that was the lowest point. But you just... I just kind of sat down for a minute and I sorted my trainers out because my laces were a bit loose and just kind of looked at the view because it was a beautiful day. And I thought, all right, then, yep, next, next, you know, eight, nine hours is going to be pretty miserable, but let's just get through it. And you just turn around and you start plodding back uphill again. And that was it. You know, it's just, it is tough, but you just, you just really, it's going to be over soon, you know. (laughs) It's not, it's not that long a day, really. It's just like a really long day at work. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and you just get it done. And you know that the feeling of finishing is, is going to be far more, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. than, than you know, it, I, I'd rather have that than to sit with a d- big DNF hanging over me just because I yeah. couldn't face another 10, 12, 15 hours of it. You know, it's a short period of time in the grand scheme of things. So you just have to keep going one foot in front of the other. I wonder if that's what caught a few people out, that there was a, a kind of a relatively high DNF rate, but that the, the weather on the day, yeah, it's a little bit hotter than what people expected. And yeah, just super, super tough. It's so wonder. slow. It's just so slow. I think that's probably what got people, that panic of like, I'm moving so slowly. I am moving so slowly. I think that probably affects a lot of people because it's a bit demoralising when, yeah. when the kilometres tick by just so slowly. But if you're used to like a Lakeland 100 trail or where you don't do any summits, you know, it's the passes or maybe say a hard moors or a centurion or even the arc. And then, yeah, you're doing a 20 odd minute kilometre. That is going to fry your mind pretty quick. What were your goals <laughs> on the start line for UTS? I was really intimidated by the route. Uh, I reckoned it with Nikki Spinks. Um, I reckon most of it with Nikki. And then I did the last, uh, did uh, sorry, I did the first 50 kilometres on my own about two weeks before the race. I was so daunted and it was so daunting and so intimidating. So for me, just finishing was actually number one because I thought, you know, having done the whole route, I was like, how am I going to piece this together? Like, you know, I did that first 50 kilometers, you know, just two, what, two, three weeks. I can't quite remember what it was, two or three weeks before the race. And I was, by the time I got, I did that 50 kilometers and I I had got to Capel Kerrig, I was done. I, I, you, there was no part of me that could keep going up Moyle Shibod, Shib, uh, Shibod. And I thought, how am I going to do this twice more on the day? Like, I was so intimidated by it. So for me, my number one goal, well, my number one goal was, was to try and finish. But I knew that I could piece it all together quite nicely if I could get to Kapil Kerrig feeling good. And that yeah. was my goal, try and get to Capel Kerrig feeling good. And because I knew that was, yeah, that was going to be be it for me, really. How how did you do that? Did you focus on nutrition or pacing or? Um, yeah, pacing, probably most of it. So I, I knew that a lot of people were at risk if they hadn't wrecked the route going off too fast on the first hill because the very up, first time up Snowden, up that Lamberis Pass is very runnable. So <laughs> I knew that I, I couldn't fall into the trap of getting pulled along with people who were maybe going to run that whole the whole. Um, ascent and then I knew that the next two climbs um, were going to be really really tough they're probably the two toughest climbs in the whole thing so I knew that I had to pace those two sections well um, so I was quite lucky actually because I was I was running with another girl from Austria so um, that kind of took my mind off it and we were kind of pacing each other quite well we weren't going too fast or too slow so so that made a, that made a big difference and yeah just having people around you really and I did over take quite a few people in that first kind of 50 kilometers and that's always a bit of a morale booster because I you know I'd started off kind of I think I was fourth maybe when I started at the oh yeah probably when I got to top of Snowden I was probably fourth lady and then you know by the time I I'd kind of come down off Penner Olwen you know I was in kind of first place and that was quite a 
big morale booster because I wasn't gunning it like I was well within my comfort zone. So, yeah. I, I, you know, that that made a big difference to me. And it was just about trying to stay within that comfort zone uh, to get to Capital Carrig. And then then I knew that, you know, the rest was going to be I could probably I could probably get through the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> And what, yeah, what stage is that? Is that in the race? And I'm just trying to visualize this. So that's the first 50 kilometers. So the first fi- is first 50 k is very, very, very technical. So that's where you go over the kind of die. You know, you go down Devil's Kitchen. It's really, really technical. A lot of big steep climbs. So there's like, I think over it's well over three and a half thousand meters of elevation in that first 50 kilometers that was why yeah that was why I knew pace and that was going to be really really important and um, yeah so that yeah and then then you know the next 50 kilometers is a little bit more runnable um, and then the last 50 kilometers has a lot of elevation but it's quite grassy not as technical yeah. so whereas like it's, it's it is I, I kind of think it is a race of three stages really mm. it's like First 50k, middle 50k, where it's horrifically boggy. Some sections are kind of runnable, but there's also some very, very, very wet sections. And then the last 50 kilometers, which is dry, grassy, you know, you're going up Snowden again, you know, it's a lot less technical. How do you feel when you're going over that really technical terrain in the first 50k? Because as you said, getting out of that in one piece meant not only good pacing, but good fueling too. Did you manage to uh, sort of fuel well over that or did you take a bit of a hit? No, no, I did. To be fair, I was I was doing all right. So I, was, I, I mostly survive on gels and kind of liquid nutrition, really. So just kind of kept those going in. But I really made a point. I'm usually quite bad at eating at checkpoints, but I made a point. I, I had to I forced myself to eat something solid at every sing, single checkpoint, be that bananas, oranges, sandwiches. Oh, I ate so many sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> Sick of sandwiches by the end. Um, or And then they had three hot fuel stations. So I made sure I ate full bowl of chili at every single station and actually doing that I found that I didn't actually need that yeah. much else yeah. to keep me going and um, so I was taking gels on board and things like that but but that was pretty much it and, and what's your gel of cho- choice just bog standard gels high five <laughs> cheap and simple and then I'm quite I quite like for something a bit less sickly and a bit less sweet, I quite like the supernatural fuel pouches. Oh yeah, so, yeah I've seen those. Um, I quite like the consistency of them. They they provide a decent amount of sugar and carbs and protein and fat, but it just kind of it doesn't. They seem to suit my stomach well, so I don't seem to get many stomach issues on that. Um, so yeah, that's just what I'm at the moment. Keep, keep it simple. Yeah. How was your stomach? I know like hundred. I think you had some stomach issues. How was it? ETS. Yeah, uh, going really well until um, somebody offered me some soup. And um, <laughs> in my head, they're like, do you want some soup? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I want some soup. I want some soup. And then they proceeded to, I don't know, I don't know what you would call them. Poor is not the right word. <laughs> it just, it was really thick vegetable soup and looked like vomit. <laughs> and they poured it into my mug. And I thought, oh, that doesn't look very appetizing. And then I said, can you can you run it? Can you dilute it with a bit of water, please, uh, to see if it'll go down a bit more easily? But they diluted it with cold water. So I ran out the door and I took a swig of this soup, which was just tepid vomit is the only way I can, I can describe it. And it went down. Hit my stomach and came straight back up. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then I was, uh, I was like retching outside this um, checkpoint in um, line of this thing, yog. And I was like, "You're right, you're right. Do you, do you want to just take a minute, maybe sit down for a minute?" And I was like, "Once I vomited, I was like, no, I'm grand now. It's out my system. I'm away. I'll see you later." You can rally. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, that was that was um, that wasn't so good. Uh, and then. Yeah, a little bit of nausea and it just when it got daylight, I think probably because I hadn't eaten anything because that was like, yeah, there was a long period where I didn't really eat very much because I was feeling a bit nauseous. And then, uh, but then I had a jam, jam, peanut butter and jam sandwich and that kind of picked me up. And then I did get sick again. I, I'm a puke and rally person. Do you know, I'm all about it. Puke and rally. <laughs> where you go. Does the job. Yeah. Um, and then I got really dehydrated between because uh, it's quite a long leg, a long, slow leg. I got quite dehydrated between Beth Gellert and um, uh, uh, the Riddu um, checkpoint. 
And when I got into the checkpoint, I was so thirsty and, and I wanted some juice. So I got a pint of juice and I, I don't like really strong squash, but it was made up quite strong and I didn't realize it. So I downed this pint of squash and my stomach was just like, no, you don't. <laughs> and it just came, it came back up and I was like, no, because I'm so thirsty. Yeah, so uh, I was a bit frustrated at that. But but what I did, I, I, I ditched the squash and I got some electrolytes. Um, and I just kind of sit, I sat down for about five minutes and I sipped a pint of electrolytes kind of over five five minutes or so and that made a huge difference my stomach didn't mind that I think it was just the volume that I put in yeah it. chugged it it was just like uh-uh, no you don't <laughs> <laughs> so but other than that no so in terms of compared to how I felt at the Lakeland 100 I was actually very pleased with my nutrition to be yeah. fair and like I say puke and rally no point in feeling sick just get sick just get sick and keep going <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Don't listen to that advice, everybody. <laughs> no, but it's good advice that you took five minutes. I'm terrible at a checkpoint. I'm like, you want to be in and out as quick as possible. Yeah. Even when I see people around taking taking five minutes, and then off they go and they'll take they'll go past me maybe ten or fifteen minutes later. But yeah, just hear you say that. Somebody who's actually won the race to take that time to eat and drink. Yeah, that's great advice. What about your kit? You mentioned like almost three different races. How do you pick a shoe for that? What was your shoe for, for that race? Um, yeah, so my shoe is the same that I wore for the Lakeland 100. Um, so the Spin Infinity. Um, yeah, it's just it's just a cracking shoe, to be honest, for that sort of terrain. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not amazing on wet, slippery grass, but there, there's not much of it on that uh on that course and it's pretty good on kind of you know boggy ground super comfortable really 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 good because they're european shoe they're absolutely fantastic on uh, technical rocky ground and superb if that rock is wet i mean they're just the grip on them is just fantastic and yeah i didn't change my shoes at all i did change my socks but yeah finished the race didn't have any issues at all really no blisters to speak of feet were a bit you know um they were trench footy but they didn't seem to like going into cold water by the end so every time i went into cold water they like spasmed wildly which wasn't very pleasant right. <laughs> so i did by the end normally i just kind of power on through all the mud and the water and everything but by the end the pain of going into cold water i had to keep avoiding the bogs uh but other than that no they're fine so yeah they're just super yeah super comfy shoe and did you did you make a move to, I know you said you found yourself in first place. Was that a conscious thing or it's just literally how your pace was against other runners? Yeah, I honestly, you have no idea how surprised I was when I came down off Penarolwen. So Penarolwen is like the, is it Penarolwen? Penarhel you do, I think it is actually, it's called. Um, Gary and I are offering no advice on how to yeah, do it. Yeah, I don't know. I, well, I can't just pronounce it. You're doing it so yeah, well. You make it yeah. sound like you know what you're talking so, about. It's half the yeah, battle, it's a, isn't it? It's quite a technical scrambly ascent. Uh, quite short, but it is quite technical. And I was running with this girl, Sophia, from Austria. Um, and we were both going up there. And then you come to this absolutely beautiful descent. It is like the Penna, or not the Penna, it's the Chievi. It's this just beautiful grassy descent. So like the only nice descent in the whole thing. <laughs> and it is absolutely beautiful. And I ran down there, because that's my favourite type of running. And I ran down there and I got to the bottom where there's a checkpoint. And Anna, Anna was there. Uh, the lady who was in first place and I just I was so shocked because I thought god she must be an hour ahead because you know super super strong runner so Sophia and I got there and I you know I was feeling really good and at that time I was having I was actually really enjoying myself I was just having a really nice day out (laughs) and um I said, oh, hey, how's it going? And she was just like, not good, not good at all and uh, yeah, so we left the checkpoint together we ran together for I don't know, half a kilometre or something. But then just just very, very naturally, without really trying, so to speak, I just kind of slowly kind of pulled away. And I think a lot of that probably came from that arc training where that flat, it was quite a flat section. It is a flat section, actually. It's kind of like a long kind of a canal thing near a reservoir. I think that was where that kind of flatter training for the arc came into it because I just... 
switch off and it's I, I call it free running which yeah. Nikki hates me calling it free running but it's free it requires no energy to run along this and um so I just very very natural just very slowly just kind of got a little bit further ahead and, and that was kind of it really yeah so it wasn't intentional it just that pace that I was moving at just kind of naturally was just just a small little fraction faster that was it no drama no, it wasn't. No so you weren't running scared once you got the lead. Sometimes I think yeah, well, I'm ever in the lead. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was petrified. Uh, even I got some false information near the finish oh. that um, Sabrina Stanley is obviously a phenomenally talented yeah. runner, like phenomenally talented. Like I'm not anywhere near as good as her. I got some slightly false information that she may have only been about 20 minutes behind me at the last checkpoint. And I knew that the last section was going to be quite fast and runnable. And so for that entire <laughs> time i was just thinking she's coming she's coming she's gonna yeah. she's gonna overtake me she's gonna overtake me she's gonna that's it i'm done there's no way i can win this <laughs> and i ran around the corner just to the finish line and i was sprinting because i was 100 certain she was oh. gonna be behind me <laughs> i honestly i mean sprinting is quite funny because you look at the pace on strap and it was like six minute case but I felt like I was sprinting <laughs> take it, take it, yes. <laughs> that's all that matters uh, yeah and uh, yeah so I was petrified I was 100% convinced she was going to take me on that last ascent and um yeah. and what was the gap in the end between you and Sabrina a couple of hours yeah I think it was it was over two hours it might yeah. have been years to three uh, but if you look at it a lot of that distance was put in the last <laughs> was when I found out that, or when somebody told me she was only 20 minutes behind me. Um, if you were that person, to... speak up, but you know, you gave Emma a good run. Do you know what? Oh, more power to her because she broke her poles. I think it was somewhere near Connect. So I think she ran like 40 miles with no poles. And I, I do you know what? I couldn't have done it. More power to her because. Yeah, those poles got me up those last few hills. Yeah. The cheat sticks. The cheat, cheat sticks. sticks. I've been doing a lot of training without the cheat sticks while my mates have been using their cheat sticks. And I'm like, you feel you're going backwards. <laughs> you that little bit, not only a little bit of power, but a bit of grip as well. And you're like, there's just no way. Just guys, wait for me. Did you use yeah. them from the very beginning, the cheat sticks? Oh, yeah. Cheat yeah. sticks all the way. <laughs> I, I, I attribute my quick recovery to my cheat sticks because actually my legs, I, they were a wee bit tired, but my legs were grand, you know, 48 Ooh. hours later, no issues at all. So yeah, cheat sticks for the win. And what does recovery look like for you? Are you there in your Norma Tech boots and a protein shake or are you just whatever you fancy? A what? <laughs> The protein shake, the Norma Tech. I've never used them, but I've seen them on Facebook. Those uh, I've recovery used them. Boots. I've got a friend who's got them, and every time I do a big race, she delivers them outside my house for a week, and I'm allowed them for a week. Ooh. They are amazing. They're about, but are they a few just, grand? Yeah, that's why she just lends okay. them. Then she, so I'm only allowed them a week. She knows that <laughs> then she has to take them back. They are made. The best thing about them is that once you get them on, you can't move, and so you just have to place orders from the sofa of tea. <laughs> are you? Is someone go past the kettle? Can you switch it on? <laughs> Google it, Emma. Normative. Yeah, they're like a big compression. Basically, they sort of right. inflate and exhale. They are lovely. There's no. I don't think there's much scientific evidence to say they actually do very much. But I, yeah, do, I, I don't. Love them. Any... If you enjoy them, if you like I enjoy. Them. Enjoy them and they may sit down. Yeah, sorry, I interrupted. What's what's your recovery look like after a huge effort like that? I mean, I don't run for a week or so, but I had a horrifically busy week at work. Uh, so, yeah, that wasn't very fun. Um, and my shoulders, I'll tell you one thing. Cheat sticks are great, but my my shoulders and like my traps <laughs> suffered mm, mm, immeasurably. Yeah. It was minger. It was just horrible. Uh, that was where I had the most pain was in my, my back and my shoulders. And yeah, then I had a really busy busy week at work, uh, which used which my shoulders. Using quite a lot. your shoulders, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, so recovery wasn't great, uh, but, but I did. I, you know, I rested my well. Aside from standing on my feet for like. 10 hours a day, I rested my legs. <laughs> Do you track like heart rate variability? We chat about it on the podcast quite a lot. So the HRV, that you, I think you just get the data on your watch. Is that something you look at? No. No? no I'm a very simple person. I, <laughs> I, do. I love it. Sometimes I think there's too much noise in my running. <laughs> so- there's a lot of noise from you, Gary. Oh, <laughs> 
<laughs> simplified we've got a patreon question actually we have i suppose answered it uh partly but i'll ask it again uh, yeah matt randell would like to know how you keep focused on the task of finishing the race when you begin to feel the doom of tightness sweeping across your body matt does spend a great deal of time and a large dollop of energy battling his brain interested if you have any tips and strategies yeah we have i suppose partly mentioned this earlier but anything to add to that so i think a lot of people well if if you're in if you're into ultra running you probably know that there's probably a disproportionate number of people with medical background or a veterinary science background um because i think inherently we have fairly resilient mental attitudes and and fairly stubborn and fairly driven so i think that mental side of it maybe is already there it's built in almost so I don't really think of it any differently to like a really long, hard day at work, you know, where yeah. you come up against lots of different challenges and you've got to do some problem solving and, you know, you are tired physically, you're tired, but you have to keep doing it. And it's putting it into perspective. There's like there's two things really, like one, you have to count yourself as being so lucky that you can even be out there and do that because there's so many people who can't, who don't have that opportunity to push themselves to that that limit. And two, it's, you know, it's just, you know, time. One thing we can't stop is time moving forward. And it's like being in the now um, it's hard to explain, but like I don't think about anything in the past or the future. I just think about now, and yeah. and time suddenly becomes irrelevant. Especially if you stop looking at your watch, it becomes irrelevant. Like it's so you're just living in the now, and actually that's one of the things I like about it is that I don't have to worry about any stresses at work or anything like that. I just think about how am I feeling now? You know, what do I want at the next checkpoint? So you are thinking into the future, but a very short distance in the future Um, and remembering that you know it's only a day it's only 24 hours like it's not a long period of time like think about what you were doing this time yesterday it's not that long ago so it might seem like a long period of time but it's not it's so short and it's it's temporary suffering for that feeling of achievement at the end of it and again it's 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 the privilege of being able to be there and just stop and look around you and just look at the view like stop looking at your feet if you're feeling rubbish just stop and actually look around you and think wow this is pretty nice like this is stunning you know i'm so lucky to be out here in the fresh air and, and doing this I think yeah, we need to record that little section and then people can just play it to themselves when they're having a right pity party <laughs> at the bottom of the last climb up Snowdonia. Just play that and just say... that. You have the get... speakers as you go up Snowdonia. Yeah. They just have the speakers on. Yeah. It's the icing on the cake. All those early mornings, all those times you didn't want to run and you do it and fingers crossed you've got on the start line. And that, whatever it is, spine race where you're out for a week or a 24-hour, 100-mile, however long it takes you, that is the icing on the cake. And you're, you're right, it's a privilege. There's so many people who can't run or be outside for whatever reason. And I always think, yeah, it is going to be rubbish for probably a third of this at least. Just own it. That's what it is. The <laughs> only thing I'd add, before, before you get Emma's pep talk, is get a snack in your mouth as well, because nearly <laughs> always you feel rubbish because you've not got the calories. So in order yeah. to really enjoy and process that amazing pep talk, get yourself half a cliff bar or a gel whatever your snack of choice is, get some calories in you and then... Bella Forte, I, Eddie. One script, oh, come on. Get one of our Patreon partners. <laughs> Deals. <laughs> no, it's true. Food food plays a huge part of it. And actually, sometimes you can almost feel it working sometimes, you know, mm. if you you know, if you are feeling a bit rubbish and you take something and if you focus on it, you think, oh, hang on a minute, 10 minutes later, oh, I do feel better than I felt 10 minutes ago. But yeah, it's interesting because the mental side of it for me is probably, won't, you know, just as important sometimes, if not more important than physical mm. fitness. And, and I would love, you know, when I hear these people who DNF'd for, for various, you know, because they were battling their mental demons or whatever, you know, I would love to talk to them a bit more and, and see what it is because because I, I probably am a little bit lucky that I don't let those demons get to me as to me as much as some people maybe do, and um, I'm sure yeah I don't know whether it's an in, in like a built in mechanism or whether it's something that you can learn I don't know 
I don't know whether you can train yourself to do it. I, I really don't know. I yeah. definitely think there's there's a definite learning curve as well as if you do, do DNF. I reckon lots of people that will be listening from Snowdonia who did DNF will be going, I'm going to go back and I'm going to be mentally stronger because I bet 99% of the DNFs were the mental. Yeah, were the mental And going, and you definitely can learn that and turn that around. And But sometimes if you're not really strong like you, Emma, you have to almost experience the DNF and the weakness to then turn it around, don't you? And go, I, I, that's how I felt. I don't want to feel like that again. And so what can I do to get stronger? How can I harden, callous myself off in a very David Goggins sort of way? David Goggins together, oh my God, you'd be formidable. Take over the world. Um, now, talking about sort of like the mental approach to races, now you've done, you, you've you won some very high profile races. You've beaten some very high profile runners as well. Do you, are you starting or do you feel the pressure when you're on the starting lineup now? But you're such an organic and a sort of like, I love the running. I'm so happy to be there. But are you starting to feel the pressure when you're on the start line now that you've got to perform, you've got to win this, or are you still very much in the moment, I love doing what I'm doing and the result will take care of itself. Yeah, I think so. I'm not, you know, at the end of the day, it is a hobby for me. It's not my career. You know, it, it, it's it's a very time consuming hobby, but it is a hobby. <laughs> yeah, um, I get that. And, you know, and I, I think I, for that reason, because I enjoy it and I don't necessarily feel a huge amount of pressure yeah there is pressure there but like you know the pressure that I feel is more from me rather than peers or sponsors or you know social media or whatever it's more pressure for myself because realistically when I go out there and race uh, yes obviously you're competing against other people but actually most of the time I'm competing against myself and being the best that I can be so like uh, you know for me it isn't always you know, it's not necessarily about being first lady for me. Actually, is is trying to be as high up the rankings as possible. I, you know, I don't. I want to be as good as I can be. You know, and yeah, whether that's first lady or top ten overall or you know tenth lady, it doesn't matter as long as I have done the best that I can do on that day. Yeah. So for that reason, because it's more me I'm competing with, I probably don't feel as much pressure. You know, don't you? You know, yeah. you're doing your best. I know that. Enough. And yeah, like if if I, you know, if the day went, went badly and, you know, that's just how it was, I I would just sit back and say, right, well, I'm just here. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy the route. I think for me, a lot of the races I do, I have to really respect and enjoy the route. So, you know, there's a lot of routes, I, a lot of races I probably wouldn't do because, you know, they're mostly on the road or they don't really have a, you know, I don't know. The route has to mean something to me. So for me, UTS was a route. I didn't know if I could do it. Mm. Really, to mm. be honest, I really didn't know if I could do it. Uh, so that was for me. Big the arc, you know, the arc's just a beautiful, beautiful route and a fantastic event. So yeah, I don't enter as many races as maybe some people do because the ones that I do enter, I'm going to put put my heart and soul into them. Really talking it. So talking about races, going to enter what. Um... You win a UTMB place from your first place at Snowdonia. Uh, is that what is next on the calendar for you? Or no, that- no, it's not. Maybe next year. I'm not ready for UTMB. So I, I have to go into a race thinking, you know, can I do the best that I can? Uh, I'm not ready for UTMB. So, yeah, that will probably be a focus next year. Uh, when, you this- mean, when you mean you're not ready, do you mean like you physically. feel you could physically you want to be like, up as strong as you can be or is that yeah so it's again it's it's kind of UTMB is quite a well it's obviously a very fast race uh, but there's some things there which I just not quite ready for so like those really long long runnable ascents which are hard to replicate in the UK like I'm not used to that you know there's there's a lot of things I probably need to sort out in kind of my physical fitness um, before I'm ready to really tackle UTMB because if I'm going to go and do UTMB I want to give it my best shot so yeah there's some training there that I, I, I haven't had time to think about yet but, yeah. but that I want to do before I can go and do that so next year I'll probably make that my primary focus next year yeah so this year I'm doing Lavaredo next month that's just a holly holiday is holly, it because I imagine you've not done much <laughs> no <training. laughs> no don't. I knew because I see you on Strava but so you're going to sort of have maybe I don't know if you discussed it with coach a couple of weeks get back into running and then it'll be taper time again yeah so I'm really just going because it looks like a stunning route it looks absolutely amazing but I'm not going to be 
ready for it because yes I can do a little bit of the heat training but I can't do any of the altitude training I'm going to struggle to get those really runnable long ascents ascent you know training for that I'm going to struggle to get that in so realistically I'm just going for a bit of a, a jolly so, so go and enjoy that is that the Dolomites, um, is it Lavaredo? Yeah. yeah, that's the Dolomites, oh. yeah. Oh, my goodness. It looks it's stunning. Beautiful. It looks absolutely stunning. So, uh, yeah, so that's just a bit of a jolly. So my next big focus is actually Tour de Gion's in September. Oh, <gasps> exciting. Yeah. Now, I need to work this out because I'm doing Tot Dret, which is the second half of Tour de Gion, with an eye on doing Tour de Gion next year. I need to work out if I'm going to pass the guys doing Tour de Gion. How I start on the Tuesday night. And you start on the Sunday? I mean, I don't know what I'm doing next week, let alone... <laughs> okay, so let's not go into the details. But maybe I'll see you. Maybe we'll see each other. Maybe maybe, yes. That is super exciting. Your yes. first foray into big, 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 big mileage there. But yeah. um, we'll suit you. We'll suit you. I love the way you said you're not ready for UTMB, but just going to do Tour de Gion. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I've got a bit more time to kind of, well, yeah, I don't know. Why? I think because UTMB is like, oh, that's like put your big pants on, you know, like that. It's, <laughs> it's, very, it's put your big pants on and you would be, you, you know, you would be like, you want to go, you'd be cited there. You'd be one of the like top 10 favourites and you want, you'd want to go going, you couldn't go there and going, oh, no, I'm just having a holiday. This yeah, is just exactly. a fundraiser. You can't do that, can you? <laughs> no. So I get, I totally no. get that. Whereas Tour de Gion, you can go and like, yeah, you can go and do, treat it. It can be, it can be a race, it can be a holiday, it can be everything all at once because you've got enough time out there to. <laughs> yeah. And I think hopefully, I haven't quite organized it yet, but hopefully I can get out for a little bit of time before to do a bit of acclimatization. Cause that's one thing like I'm not going to get to do before Lavaredo. You know, it's just not going to happen. So I'll just have to deal with the altitude when I'm there. And I don't know, I've never really been altitude so I don't know how it's going to affect me I mean it could go anything from like doesn't bother me at all to I could end up in hospital so I don't know know. (laughs) just keep keep eating and drinking eating and drinking and moving and the thing like with Lavaradio is like you're not at altitude for long, so you can feel really rubbish at the top of a climb, but then you quickly drop 600 metres and you feel better. So it's not like you're going up and staying high for a long time. So you're so quick, you'll be up enough it before you feel altitude won't have a chance with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so awesome. I'm looking forward to that. Should be should be a good, good trip out. Amazing, yeah. yeah. What about um, Barclay Marathon? I did see some pictures of you over there. I know you can't tell us if you apply. We've been there with some previous guests. Uh, but in theory, would it be something that you'd like to send a letter off to Laz and a number, pl- oh, a number plate? Again, I'm, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I know my limitations. I know what I can and can't do. Um, and I'm, I'm not quite ready for Barclay yet. I think I could be ready. Whether I could be ready for next year... I don't know. We'll see how tour goes. Uh, if tour goes well, yeah, I might give it a crack. Uh, if not, I will probably make it a, a focus for the year after. But yeah, it's again, you know, I have to go in that. I have to go in feeling confident. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like that study, isn't it? That I can never remember who published it, but you know, the study about women have to be like. 80% certain they'll complete yeah I've heard of this yeah com- you know <laughs> uh, complete it before they'll actually enter enter the race yeah. and I, I am a bit like that like yeah I mean the chances of me finishing Barclay are incredibly slim but I would like to be able to say yeah I can go and do a fun run you know and um, just at the moment probably not quite there not quite there very exciting <laughs> I love it sweet quick five quick unless you've got any more questions that's good. I'm ready. I'm ready because I'm going to get get some deets out of this quick five. <laughs> okay, right. We do. This comes up quite often, actually, on my yeah. social media. People yeah, are out on the trails not... and they're scared of big wildlife. But yeah, if you say a big, scary cow on the trails, that blocking the trails, sorry, what is the best way to get past them? Any, t- any tips? Yeah, don't run. Why do people run? So if you run, they think you're playing a game and they'll run with you. So just walk <laughs> past them. Walk past them. Don't run. Silly to run because they'll just run with you and they're thinking, oh, this is great. This is so much fun with this person (laughs) running. I'm going to run with them. And then that's quite scary. So just walk past them. Most of the time, like if you're on a reasonably well-used trail, they won't go near you. They'll be so used to people. So just walk past them. Yeah. 
Cool. If you're Emma. really scared, take a stick. They don't they don't like sticks. Yeah. Keep, that's, get a stick I, if you're scared. I, that's like I carry my sticks around here all the time because the alpine cows are enormous. They won't and they won't move. So you have to go quite, you know, those like narrow single tracks as well. If they're standing on the trail, you have to like climb halfway up around the m- mountain to get them. And then I just keep the stick if I've got to go up behind their backside, just going, I'm here. Don't kick me now. I'm gonna die. <laughs> Oh, they'll be really well, like handled those ones. So they're probably. Really oh friendly. yeah, they're ne- they'd never check. They got they're so big. They'd never move fast. It's more that I'm just like they're just suddenly going to swat a fly, and then I'm off down the hill, <laughs> never to be seen again. <laughs> Not a bad way to go, is it? But... No, no, on an alpine trail. <laughs> <laughs> an alpine trail, Maleki pole. I was uh, stressing sheep out on my uh, run through the night on the hard moors. Really, I've never seen so many sheep, and they're all on the path, and they were like just <gasps> and their eyes in your head talk oh, yeah. like it's quite scary it's pretty, isn't free. It? it's pretty free oh that's the thing actually at night uh just with some some advice for people running at night when they make cows so cows do get a bit I don't know if it's spooked or a bit more inquisitive by head torches. So they can be a bit more intimidating with head torches. So just knock your head torch off and they can't see you. Good tip. Easy. Good tip. They can't <laughs> smell a <the> fear. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Favorite training session. The coach sends you the plan. What do you dread and what do you like? I dread most of it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> How much of your how much of your scent training plan do you do versus how much do you interpret it as Emma sessions? Uh, well, we call them non compliances because Kim Kim uses training peaks. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> half of mine are probably non compliant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's my favorite? I don't know what's my favorite. Really. I read uh, something that you loved, which I love doing too, and I always love the recce's more than the actual race. Oh yeah, I definitely. Love Especially with a mate, a long recce mm. of something you're going to race, so it's got a purpose. But just yeah. taking your time to enjoy a long day out is like my oh, favorite. Definitely. Oh, I thought you meant these like fancy training sessions that people do, which I don't really do anyway. No, but well, no, we knew no, we knew the answer. To we? <laughs> no, that's no, what I was like. Um, I thought you might have changed and gone. Yes, yeah, so I love three, two, one minutes of a very short recovery, and be like, my God, good permit session. No, uh, no, I do. I love big days out. Like really, really big days out. The more like I do prefer runnable like runnable trails. So like probably my favorite day out, which I'm going to do shortly actually, because I haven't done it in a while. It's like something like the Yorkshire Three Peaks, which is just unadulterated running at its finest. You know, it's oh, yes. just cracking, cracking day out. You're building an ark and you can only save one animal. What's it going to be? Ow. We knew that, we said. <laughs> Winners. Maybe we, we asked this question last time. We don't need to on the podcast time. anymore, Emma. We can just... Uh... We can just guess the answers. <laughs> cool. <laughs> there is no more versatile and amazing animal than the cow. It's like... so lucky that you feel like that with the job that you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know what I'd save. I think I'd probably save a dog. A dog? A dog. Yeah. Would you save a dog? Yeah. yeah. You can't eat them, though. You can't eat them if everything goes to the top. Why not? It's got a bit of, nice bit of... It's not a big meal, is it? <laughs> I heard this somewhere. No. If you're going to be, uh, not a vegetarian, obviously, but some people eat, say, a chicken, you should probably eat a cow. If you're going to eat one animal, because how many meals you get per death. This is mm. quite a grim off, off topic. Um, a cow is probably the best way to go. Yeah. You know, we, one, well, my kids expensive. were talking about that only this morning because they went up the road to collect the oh. eggs from our neighbour. She leaves eggs out and um, they fight. I love this, that they're so little. They fight over who goes up with the four euros to get the eggs. And then they were like, so we should eat cows because they're bigger and we'd get more beef burgers than chicken. Yeah. And I was like, well, yeah, it's quite it's a good point. But, but look at all the things you can get from that cow. So you can have milk, cheese, ice cream, chocolate. Um... Your arc's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> You've got all the real lattes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Milk in your coffee. Yeah. Yeah, flat white. You're so right. but, yeah. you, but we've got the dogs, you know, at the end of the day, the cow at the end of the bed's not really going <laughs> to... No. Not the cuddles. <laughs> okay, we, we've got a Patreon uh, quick fire question from Steve Chamberlain. What has been your f- favourite ever race and which one is top of your bucket list? I think the Ark's my favourite ever. Absolutely love that race. And I just think everybody should do it because it's just stunning. Absolutely stunning. Fantastic atmosphere. Brilliant organisation. Just loved it. 
And it went well. I probably would yeah. feel a bit different. Yeah. <laughs> if it didn't go well. That always helps. Yeah. It's like it's like the Lakeland Hundred is always just that race that just I'll never go back. Yeah. <laughs> it just was so yeah, bad. It's left too much um, on the trail. Yeah. What's on my bucket list? Probably the Barclays. God, Boy, over yeah. UTMB Barclays and like that. Okay, love it. Last question. Every week we share the podcast over on Instagram stories. It's your choice of the music, though, Emma. What song are you going to pick? I was pre-warned about this question because um, my partner James listens to every episode. Um, Thanks, James. <laughs> Thank you, James. James. Come on, Emma, get on it. <laughs> and I, I was very disappointed to learn that running up that hill has just been... <gasps> been it used. has. <laughs> it has. You can have it again if you want. Yeah. I, w- I would choice. have that. If not, I would probably go for um, an old school class kind of throwback to my teenage years of um, Wherever I May Roam by Metallica. Oh, I love that oh, song. Oh, Gary is going to pee that his pants a little bit. <laughs> oh, <my> gosh. <laughs> yes. That's been the best Instagram song so far. That one. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> We're writing it down. Can't forget this yeah, one. Yeah, I've written that down. Yeah, I've had to write the whole title. <laughs> Emma, awesome. thank well, you so much. Time. Huge well done on uh, UTS and and the ARC and everything. Thank you so much for uh, giving up your bank holiday to chat to us. Good luck with uh, Lavaredo. We look forward to your holiday. Oh, my God. Am I going to Instagram story you when you go, yeah. Emma's taking the lead at Lavaredo on her holiday ARC. Uh, definitely don't <laughs> so. No, I hope you feel good. You have a great time out in the Dolomites yeah. and um, good luck with the rest of the year and next year. Keep us posted. Hopefully, we'll be able to chat to you again in a few months with your next uh, amazing athletic endeavor. Yeah, it thank sounds you very much. Awesome. It's been fun. Thank you. Take care. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks so much, Emma, for coming on the show. I think we can take a lot from Emma. We need to be, uh, I think people, there's a lot of overtraining that goes on over there and a lot of taking things a little bit too seriously. But I love the way that Emma, she is very much, you know, though she is now coach, she still runs very organically. She doesn't take things too seriously. But then when she goes out to race, she really, really hard. And I love that. I'm going to try yeah. and channel a bit of Emma in a few weeks' time as well. Garrett, guess what? Guess what's occurring? I hope we missed out last week, but I hope it's a five-star review. I think it's all down to you, Gary. Champion yes. Gary. Big Stu <laughs> running. Big Stu running. How did I miss the restart? I don't know, Stu. Where have you been? Listening to back issues of the old podcast got me through a lot of mindless miles on a 200 race last November. Oh, I wonder what that was. Then we were gone. We were. Sorry about that. But now they're back. I'm a bit slow on the uptake. Still with the great Yay. banter, great guests, and some normal folk questions too. I love it when people say, you know, you, you guys are just normal, as if we are not normal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very normal. <laughs> Gary's very normal. I'm a little Promise abnormal. <laughs> <laughs> right, champ, what's coming up this week? Any races? <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing glamorous this week. And But I... I'm definitely not going to run. Oh, I didn't run yesterday. Oh Am I going to run today? Maybe I give myself a bit of grace. I'm not sure just yet. We'll see how it goes. Rex was really restless last night, so I need to tire him out. But he was up and down those goddamn stairs. We were like, oh, Rex, just pack it in. He's not allowed on the bed, so there's no cuddles either. If I do a session, it's 800s. That's what's on the planet. <gasps> oh, <laughs> well 800 is okay if it was like a mile i'd be like oh my goodness that's a long way 800 is just the right side of oh it's the long. worst you have to run so fast i'd give myself like some nice little progression runs and some like five minutes steady 800s yeah. my hammies would just ping off well we'll see we'll see we'll see how it goes watch me strava see if i do but yeah a couple of long runs some strides at the end of easy runs to stay local i have been invited away this weekend to the lakes even a night out a friend has got a caravan so that was on the cards but you know I've since teenager yeah you need then, to, you all need to actually tops. see your family and yeah my wife's not working this weekend so it'd be nice to stay at home enjoy the local trails and enjoy some family time too so that is me yeah what about yourself 
Ooh, tomorrow, last long run tomorrow. I'm going to fill my cup with a totally un, um, unefficient, unspecific run. I'm going up the hill. I'm going to try my classic 20-miler, uh, which is up over the top of our local coal, down the other side, uh, all the way to Switzerland. And then I turn at Switzerland and come back again. I'm not sure about the snow. So I'm going to tuck my crampons into my bag in case there's a few little snow bridges to cross. But that's what I'm going to do tomorrow. Could choose a flatter route, but I'm not going to because I don't want to. Um, so that sounds be really glamorous. Bit. You run to Switzerland. I run to High Heseldon and back. <laughs> same, 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 <laughs> Gary. Uh, it is hot though, so I might have to do a little shorter loop for... Tarka, the older dog, first because that Lindy couldn't care less. She just is an absolute um, lunatic. But Tarky really struggles in the heat and the last. You yeah. run up, and so the last like eight miles is all downhill. So I'll be going fast, yeah. and Tarka gets just grumpier and grumpier and further further back. So I might have to do a little loop first with her. I'm going to do my last hill session, something like four to six, five minutes. Oh, just five minutes. Lovely. And then a little short, my flatter run will be shorter this week. Maybe 800, Gary. Maybe some shorter, eight, some three minutes. Get the legs on four. Uh, but I'll definitely, yeah, I'll be about 10 hours probably total running. Um, have to, this week before the full taper, I have to be really be strong because you think you can still do yeah. a big week, but then you actually then not having much of a taper because it's the week of the, the race. Oh, yeah. So yeah. yeah, you have to do the cutback, even though I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to. But so gym? I try I, I do work? this yeah, two gym sessions always. Um I'll just keep that that all same and I'll do one, probably one next week. I always do two a week. Nice and heavy. Nice and heavy. I don't make it complicated. I have it written on my wall. I went to the gym with George on Friday because of the race on Saturday. I didn't lift anything. So I was like his personal trainer. <gasps> oh my gosh. I love it. He's going to want that every time now. He's going to want my dad, you put the weights away for me. Or you I'm, a bit, I'm a bit bossy. <laughs> Poor George. I know, poor George. Uh, yeah, so that's it. And uh, I need to sort out, get some fuel ordered, get onto Velo Forte because I'm, I'm getting, I need about what? How many packets of uh, gel chews do you reckon? Twenty. <laughs> <laughs> it's on its way. I've reached out. It's on. Its oh, way. thank you. Um, and then lots of life admin. Get on top of that. Try and fill my taper time with. Yeah. Yeah, like you have admin. more time for these things. Yeah, yeah. I try and get ahead of that and work and stuff so that then the week after the 100, when you're absolutely useless, you're not chasing your tail as well. Right, that's enough. That's enough Twittering. We've got to get on and, uh, well, we've got a busy day. Hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks for listening. Thanks to our partners and patrons, new and old. Be kind to your future self. Unpack that dishwasher. Hang out that washing. Put that laundry away. Give yourself some clean sheets. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe and follow. We love you all. Have a great week. Stay safe on the trails. Lisa had a little incident on the trails actually. Not going to go into too much details but she trusted her spider senses and uh, got herself out of there yeah we laughed about it at the end but it might not have actually been a good, a good end of it yeah room wise room well and don't overdo it listen to your body as well as your favorite podcast make sure you refuel with lots of tea maybe a beer or two i <gasps> went wild you promoting? yesterday <laughs> you're promoting what's happened well i'm not really promoting i had a couple of beers after the hard moors relay on yesterday and honestly it just wiped me out. I was in bed about half an hour after the San Miguel glass had emptied. <laughs> <laughs> San <was> Miguel in... <laughs> snooze. Oh, goodness. I was just nodding off on the sofa, mate. Just go to bed, Gary. Do yourself a favour. My name is Gary Thwaites. And I'm Eddie Sutton. And that was episode 24 of Tea and Trails.